across the board. All right, it's time for us to get started. It's, uh, if we can get Gary to sit down and behave. He's, he's... <laughs> That's my brother, you know. Uh, no, 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 no. All right, we're continuing our uh, look at angel stories in the Old Testament. And uh, tonight we're going to look at uh, Ezekiel chapter 1. And there's a couple of things about it I want to talk about before we actually read, read the text. Ezekiel chapter 1 is one of the most uh, problematic from a scholarship standpoint in the Bible. There's like one or two other chapters about like this chapter that have some of the same kinds of uh, interesting uh, issues, phenomena, whatever you want to say. Um, I want to read verses um, 1 through 3, and I want you to tell me if you hear anything odd, if anything strikes you as Wait a minute, that doesn't quite ring right. Verse 1 of Ezekiel 1, In my 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day, while I was among the exiles by the Kibar River, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Verse 2, On the fifth of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiakim, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, by the Kibar River in the land of Babylonians. And there the hand of the Lord was on him. Does anything kind of tickle the back of your brain about those both verses? Anything strike you as unusual or kind of odd? I keep telling you if things are odd, they're important. Do you see anything odd? Ah, there you go. That's it. That's it. There's several places in the Bible this happens. This is one of the most obvious. Where uh, within a couple of verses, they talk about the author in the first person and the third person. You remember your high school English class? First person, second person, third person. First person is I. Second person is you. Third person is they. Right? And this, that holds true across all languages, that there's the first, second, and third person. You have to decide uh, when you're learning. Yeah? Yeah, it's, 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 we, we can get, we, we can really, really get off into some deep uh, water or weeds with, looking at this, this, the text of this, this, this verse. But I just want you to see that. And I want you to think about it among friends and not being challenged by somebody that says, look at here, your Bible's crazy, man. You can't believe it. You can't trust it. It can't even get the, uh, it can't even get the grammar right for crying out loud. A piece of grammar that transcends languages and did, uh, is, is the book written by I or is the book written by he? How would you answer that? Anybody ever come across anything like that before? Or any thought about that? I hear what you said. What, what is they, what's your question? The question is, is the book written by, the, by I or is it written by he? In other words, is it autobiographical or is it written by somebody else as a biography? And if I wanted to, I could really hammer on that and say, see there, your Bible is no good. It's, 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 it's a flawed document. They can't even get the, uh, the person right of how, who, who it was written and who, who it was written by. One verse says that I, Ezekiel, wrote it. The next verse says this happened to him. Which, who, who, who wrote this thing anyway and how'd that happen? And you start thinking it through and there's, there's some logical answers to it, but none of them really make a whole lot of sense, do they? You know, did Ezekiel write this or did somebody else write it? Um, somebody asked me one time, they said, Rick, why do you bring up these kind of things in Bible class? And my answer is because 
I want you to think these things tr through in neutral, friendly ground, not with somebody in your face making fun of you and you have no idea that that has ever been in your Bible and it's the first time you've ever seen it. I want, when, when, when somebody brings these kind of things up to you, at least I want you to be able to say, you know, I didn't really understand what he was talking about, but we talked about that in Bible class the other night. You know, at least, at least you're not caught off guard. At least you're not, you know, uh, stunned. It's not being dropped in your lap for the first time. And don't kid yourself. There are other places in the Bible that you see this same kind of a thing happen where, um, like, for example, the book of Daniel. Part of the book of Daniel says, I, Daniel, and part of the book of Daniel says, he. Same thing is true, like uh, we believe that Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, but uh, at the end of the Pentateuch, it's not Moses writing it because Moses is dead. <laughs> and he's been buried by God up on the mountaintop. And yet the, the story tells about him dying and being buried, but he wasn't alive, he, he, he wasn't alive so he couldn't have written that part of it. Um, does that kind of stuff bother you, or do you just... Kind of shrug it off and not think about it. But what, what would you say to somebody that asked you this question? Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. That is exactly the question. Is how, was, how was the process of inspiration done? How did we get the Bible that we have today? Let's, bring a, let's use a modern day example just to, to, uh, to, talk, to talk about this. I have had a, uh, one of, my, one of my, my all time favorite instructors in undergraduate school was a man by the name of Jim Massey. Jim died years ago. Uh, Jim was the guy that started the, the, uh, a lot of the distance learning kinds of things through Sunset School of Preaching in Lubbock. And uh, he was uh, director of the School of Preaching in Trinidad. He, uh, he, he uh, he taught uh, students at International Bible College. Uh, he was just an incredible, incredible man. And uh, one of the things that he would do is he would teach students how to print handout materials so they could go someplace as a missionary, open up a print shop, earn some money for groceries for their kids, and print their own materials so they didn't have to pay retail for it. And uh, um, he had just all this tons of material that he had put together that would be helpful for a missionary in a place studying with people who didn't know much about the Bible. And uh, one of the things that he was best known for was he, he actually had a little, uh, little kind of study, kind of like the one that uh, Rob's got for us back there on the back table of the foyer. It's one of those kind of a little go through the Bible studies. You sit down with somebody. It's not the same, exactly the same study, but it's very similar. Anyhow, when he passed away... Um, those of us that were his students, well, he, had a, he had literally hundreds, maybe thousands of students. And um, many of us would reach a point in our ministers where we remember, you know, Jim said something about that in a class. And so without knowing that all the other guys were doing it, different ones of us would, would write or call his wife, Joyce, who had been his office secretary for years. And we would say, Joyce, you know, Jim used to have this piece of material in the class, and I lost that out of my notes. And you think you could dig that out and send me a copy of it? And she would always say, yes, of course, yes, of course, yes, of course. And so within time, what she did was she wound up going back into all of Jim's class notes where he taught college-level classes. And she would pull out all the things that different people had asked her for, and she would put them together. Many of them have been put online. You can still find them today. Um, so the question becomes when you get a piece of paper from a man's wife after he's dead did he write it or did she write it 
it seems like a silly question, but you need to think about it a minute. Because the first time I got it, I got it from him in class. The second time I got it, he's dead. He's dead, he's gone. So she sends me a packet with some literature and a cover letter in it. And, oh, you know, she was always the grandmotherly type. He, we called him the general because he was pretty rigid and tough. And I learned lots and lots through his classes. But she was always very grandmotherly. And she sent me a, a very nice cover letter, you know, and says, you know, I'm glad you're still finding Jim's material useful. Uh, when, pull, when I pulled some of these things out, I found that he had uh, sometimes, uh, and she kind of put in parentheses, me as his secretary had misspelled a word or had added two words or had done something and she said, so I, I went back through and I kind of cleaned those up and I retyped them so they'd be good and crisp and clear and here's a brand new looking copy of it. So the question becomes, well, who wrote it, him or her? And the answer is along the lines of what, uh, uh, what we were just saying earlier, the way I see it, it's his material, but she was his secretary. She was his editor. Uh, she was not the one who thought it up. She was the, the, it was not new to her, but she cleaned it up. She made it more useful. She packaged it, and she sent it on to me. But if you had included the cover letter with all that stuff, there would be the same kind of a divide where her cover letter would say, Jim and I, or we, or I, with Jim being dead, and there'd be material deeper in that pack that would be Jim saying, I think this or I believe that. Almost like he's speaking from the grave, right? See, the same kind of thing happens with the, uh, with the way our Bible was put together. Um, there were people who wrote things and there were people who collected what was written. And you see this many times over. For example, the whole book of Proverbs, that's all it is. Solomon collected Proverbs the way some people collect coins or stamps. And his purpose was he collected the wise sayings of wise people to teach young people, specifically his own children. Not real sure how, how well that worked, but that's how he got the book of Proverbs. He collected them. Solomon didn't write all those. He collected them. He was the editor of the book of Proverbs. Now, maybe some of the Proverbs have been his or some maybe had not, but the point is he says that he collected these things. Um, we think that's how we got the book of Mark. We believe that the book of Mark is John Mark's notes that he took when he traveled with Peter who preached. And you kind of get that in the stories that, that, are, that are in there. There's some details in those stories in the book of Mark that only a close guy like Peter would have known. But Mark wasn't a disciple when Jesus was on the earth. He's too young. But he was a young protege that followed the Apostle Peter around and he took notes and the book got Mark's name on it, but where did the material come from? Well, you have to kind of read between the lines, but some of those stories had to come from somebody like Peter. They couldn't have come from a guy as young as John Mark was, and yet John Mark's book name was on there. So my point of all that is this. Uh, one of the beautiful things about the Bible is there's, there's more than you can ever study and know about in your entire life. And the deeper you dig and the more you go, the more you see and the more there is. It's just amazing. It's like, uh, it's, 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 like a, it's like a balloon. The bigger your balloon knowledge about what the Bible gets, the bigger the outside of that balloon gets touching the stuff that you don't know. And as long as you don't know much, the balloon is just a little bitty balloon and you see, I don't, well, I, don't, I, can, I think I can figure this out. There's not too much I don't know. And you start learning more and you learn more and you read deeper and you read more, more precisely and your balloon gets bigger and you, your knowledge base gets bigger, but the outside of the balloon with the edges of your knowledge gets bigger. That's true in science, it's true in medicine, but it's especially true in the Bible, more so than any other piece of, uh, of uh, any other document that I know of. So I just want to throw that out to you. That, that we are talking about a chapter that uh, if you read scholarly journals, if you read uh, commentaries, depending on who the guy is or gal, uh, in some cases, uh, what their axe is to grind, they may be using this book as a, as a yeah, poster boy for why you should throw your Bible away. Um, 
And if you come across that, just remember, you know, that crazy Rick told me something about that. I don't really remember what he had to say. But this is, remember, this is not a brand new idea. That This is not something that should surprise you. It's not something that should kill your faith. There are answers to all these things, even if we don't want to dig off into the, the, the weeds too deeply. I specifically want to talk about the rest of the chapter tonight because it has to do with our, with our angels. And... Uh, I want to begin by talking about a couple of books that were written back in the 1970s. Maybe you'll recognize some of these authors, maybe you won't. Uh, here's a, uh, a website called The Spaceships of Ezekiel. And uh, here's, the, here's what the, the, the lead blurb says. It's advertising a book that was written in the 70s. It says, in the early 1970s, a book called Chariots of the Gods made a major stir. You may remember hearing about that book? God name of Eric von Donken. You ever heard that name? They still quote him in all the alien astronaut shows on whatever the different cable channels are. Uh, author Eric von Donken claimed that there was significant historical evidence showing that the Earth was visited by astronauts in ancient times. He claimed that because humans didn't comprehend the high level of technology, that they thought the ancient astronauts were gods. You, got, you remember what I'm talking about, right? This is not a new book. This was like, what, 50 years ago now? Um, uh, it was even shown that a lot of von Dyken's evidence, it was eventually shown that a lot of his evidence did not exist or that there were forgeries that he commissioned and that he had served several prison terms for fraud. That's part of his story. You don't ever, you don't ever hear the rest of it when you, talk, when you see these alien, uh, ancient alien shows. Uh, however, Von Donkin said that the biblical prophet Ezekiel described a spaceship. Not too long after that, NASA spacecraft engineer Joseph E. F. Blumrich saw the claim and decided to prove it wrong. But when he read Ezekiel's descriptions, they sounded like things that Blumrich had designed for NASA. So he did an engineering analysis and worked out a preliminary design for the craft de de described in the book of Ezekiel. And I don't think I can show you the picture. Um, maybe. Maybe I can put this on the camera. There's a picture of the camera. They, I don't know if those of you in the back can see this or not. That's actually the cover of his book. And uh, he, he drew that after seeing the descriptions we're going to read in the book of, uh, book of Ezekiel tonight. Um, the guy who put this site together says, uh, I was quite impressed when I originally read Bloomberg's book 40 years ago. But then I started reading the entire book of Ezekiel, including the extensive prophecies and messages that claim to be from God in the Bible. Even though I knew nothing about the Bible at the time, I realized that it was not that clear and that Bloomrick had some of the same issues that Van Duncan had. And so anyhow, you can go through the rest of this website and what he does is he goes through point after point and uh, he, uh, he disputes some of the claims that these guys make. Now, I says, Rick, why are we talking about these things? I'm telling you, this chapter is one of the most controversial chapters in the entire book of the Bible. It's controversial from the standpoint of the way it's written and the text of it. The I to he, back to I, in the first chapter alone. And the thing that goes on through the rest of the book. Um, it's almost always referred to in any of these ancient alien astronaut kind of shows that you see you right or here. And you may think those are a whole bunch of baloney, but just talk to your kids and grandkids or people in your neighborhood. And you'll find that there's a huge groundswell in our country and around the world of interest in UFOs and aliens. And uh, in most cases, there's a lot of speculation from the lack of evidence and from the silence of government and from the silence of others. And the reason people are silent many times is because there is no evidence. But there's all this stuff. There's all this stuff. And I drive Tammy crazy because every so often I'll go to Netflix or something and I'll, I'll binge watch several of those episodes of uh, Ancient Aliens. 
And uh, sometimes I'll just listen and laugh, and sometimes I'll think, hmm, I hadn't heard that one yet. And, yeah, I heard that. I don't know that. I know that's not true. Yeah, I checked that. I know that's not true. Yeah, I looked into that. He didn't know what he was talking about. Yeah, they're misquoting that. Ooh, I hadn't heard that one yet. Tammy will say, would you please shut up and change the channel? <laughs> But I do that because my kids and their friends want to talk about these kind of things. And uh, I like being able to, to talk about them. Um, in case you're taking notes, in case you're one of the people that these kind of things are a problem for, um, let me give you a name of somebody online you can look at for all these kind of things. Once in a while you see him on these ancient alien shows as somebody who's opposing what's being said, but they usually don't give it, let him have his full say, and the youth will try to make him look like an idiot, but he's on one of those shows that makes a lot of sense. And uh, he spends a lot of time online interacting with younger people about these kind of things through his blogs and websites. Uh, his name's uh, Michael Heiser, and the name is H-E-I-S-E-R, uh, -E and anything he does online is excellent. It's excellent, excellent, excellent. He's a deep, serious believer in the authority and text of scripture. Uh, he's, a, he's an expert in, in all the different Semitic languages. He spent several years as a uh, scholar in residence for, for uh, Logos Bible software. And you see him constantly on, uh, on seminars and things online. Anytime you find somebody that's trying to debunk the ancient alien thing, he always gets pulled into it either as a spokesman or they quote from him or the things that he writes. And so his books are good, his websites are good. Um, what I found here was his notes on Ezekiel's vision. And what he does is he goes through and he shows point by point. Maybe I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. But he goes through point by point showing the descriptions and how the descriptions, what they really match is images from the ancient Babylonian religions. And he pulls in pictures from, from carvings and from, um, from ancient documents and shows how that there are images in those ancient documents that fit very well with what Ezekiel is describing. And he shows how that people in Ezekiel's day would have known about these pagan imagery. They would have known about these pagan documents. They would have known about these pagan beliefs. They would have seen these pagan images. And to them, they wouldn't have thought an ancient alien or an ancient spacecraft. What they would think is, ooh, Ezekiel's talking about a God that at least is the equal... And as they read Ezekiel's book, they would find that the claim in the book was that the God of Ezekiel was claiming to be greater than all these other gods that they knew these pictures of. It just kind of makes sense. It's, it's, the, it's the thing that makes the most sense, right? But we're going we're gonna to look at the, this, this, uh, this passage. And I want you to keep in mind two eyes. One eye, or one, one eye and one ear. I want you to see and hear through the eyes of somebody that's looking for UFO, ancient alien stuff. And in the other eye and ear, I want you to think about somebody that's trying to make the God of Israel look greater and stronger than the pagan gods they would have been surrounded by. Little G with an S, right? Those are the kind of the two basic ways of looking at this passage. When we get to the end of it, you can tell me which one you think makes more sense. I'm obviously prejudiced. I'm telling you ahead of time where my belief is. But if you see it differently, if you've got friends that see it differently, you ought to at least be able to discuss it with them. You ought to at least not be afraid of it. So let's read just a little bit. Starting in verse 4, Ezekiel said, I looked. See, there's that change again. It started with I. Then it says he uh, came to Ezekiel. And, and then verse 4, it says, I looked and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north. An immense cloud with flashing lightning surrounded by brilliant light. Now, if you just stop right there, what, what is the imagery? If you were watching a movie, if you were going to make a movie, what's he describing? Independence Day. A what? Independence Day. Independence Day, okay. If you're thinking about it from the UFA standpoint, you've got this mace, uh, Independence Day UFO coming down. <sighs> And the pressure front from that ship squeezing all the water into the black clouds that boil and it stops over the city, right? Okay. What else could he be describing? Thunderstorm. A thunderstorm. <laughs> Which is what the, the leading edge of the Infinite Day UFO was supposed to do, was right? It was supposed to create an artificial thunderstorm by the, the pressure front of the front of that ship. So what's he describing? Is he describing 
the results of an alien spaceship? Is he describing a thunderstorm or a sandstorm? Uh, more of a, maybe more of a Scirocco kind of a wind that, that stirred up the dust and you would have the refraction, refractions of sunlight through the, the dust particles a little more maybe than you would from a gray or dark cloud. See how you can read it either way? Yeah. Well, yeah, that, that's, that, that's exactly what he's doing. He's reporting what he saw, but the question people ask today is, well, what, what, what did he see? And he, 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 saw, he saw a storm. <laughs> well, what caused that storm? It doesn't say, other than it was a vision that came from God. So God, you could say God ultimately, ultimately caused it. Um, he says, the center of the fire looked like glowing metal. And in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. In appearance, their form was human. You catching all these little, little, little details? Some of this stuff you wouldn't have caught if we hadn't been talking about angels for the past several weeks. In appearance, their form was human, but each of them had four faces and four wings. Now, stop for just a minute there. Back in, uh, in Isaiah's vision of the throne room of God, where he saw the... The, uh, the seraphim that were flying in, the, in the, the space above the throne. How many wings did those beings have? Six. So these are not the same beings. You can't say, oh, I know what that is. That's what Isaiah saw. No. It's, it's, Isaiah saw beings with six wings. Ezekiel says he saw beings with four wings. Well, Rick, what does that mean? I don't know. I don't know. I just know that ever so often God allows the curtain to be lifted a little for us to get a glimpse and the curtain crashes back down. Whoa, I want to see more about that. No. no. Uh, so maybe it's like we were talking about before class tonight. I think a lot of the reason we don't know some of the answers to some of the questions we have is because the answers wouldn't fit in our little pea brains. You know, the, 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 the things of God and the things that God thinks and that he does. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And it's not because God's a killjoy and wants to keep you in the dark like Satan said to Eve. You, eat this, you need to eat this fruit because God's trying to keep you from something. He knows you'll be as wise as him if you eat it. See, there's no way. You can't, you can't do that. Why? Because for God to become flesh... The book of Philippians said he had to empty himself and take on the form of a human. The human body cannot contain the fullness of God. Our brains cannot fathom the fullness of God. It's just, you can't do it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a physical, spiritual impossibility, even if God wanted to do it. And that's why he sent his son. His son became flesh, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, that doesn't answer all my questions, Jesus. And Jesus says, yeah, but you can't take the rest of it. You'll blow a gasket, man. Your, 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 your computer will seize up. You know? <laughs> You'll, uh, your train will jump the rails. You can't, you can't, you can't handle it. You, you, know? you, you, you can't. Uh, what's, that, uh, what's that old uh, military courtroom movie? You can't handle the truth. Yeah, a few good men. There we go. Thanks. Uh, you know, that's a real thing when it comes to these kind of things we're talking about here. Um, he says, verse 7, after saying they had four faces and four wings, he says their legs were straight, their feet were like those of a calf, and gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on the four sides, they had human hands. Uh, all four of them had faces and wings, and the wings of one touched the wings of another. Each one went straight ahead and they did, they did not turn as they moved. I'm gonna go ahead and start this around. Let me, I won't give you these, I want this back. If you wanna jot that where I got it if you want. Uh, but I want you to look at the, uh, the, the, the pictures that he's got in this and then pass it down. That'll be better than reading his document to you, I think. And uh, when it comes back to me, I'll uh, take some time and hold it up to the camera so people watching online can see. Uh, 
Where did I stop? Uh, verse 10. Their faces looked like this. Each of the four had the face of a human being. And on the right side, each had the face of a lion. On the left, the face of an ox. And each also had the face of an eagle. Ooh, that must have been an ancient alien with, uh, with uh, DNA gene splicing technology, right? What else could it possibly be? Well, there's a lot that it could possibly be, but that's what these guys will tell you on these shows. What else could it possibly be? And, and, and the phrase that always gets me on these shows is they'll, they'll always, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll say something that's completely outrageous that they can't prove. And then they'll follow, almost always follow it with this exact same phrase dozens and dozens of times. And if that's true, then, whoa, 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 whoa. No, I'm not conceding that that's true. Where you, you, no, no, I'm not conceding that's true. Let's go back, back up and let's talk. Oh, they don't want to do that. The point of these pictures is this. These are pictures from Babylonian religion. They're pictures of, of things that they worship, things that they, they dealt with that, that were, that were uh, uh, they, 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 they thought were their gods, part of their religion. Uh, some of the pieces of furniture that they used and some of the imagery that they had. And, you know, it just makes a whole lot more sense to me that what Ezekiel is doing is he's pulling images from the world they live in and say, this is what God's like. This is what the things of God are like. Jesus did that over and over and over again in the scripture. He talks about um, the, 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 uh, the kingdom of God is like uh, a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like a man who finds a, a hidden treasure and he goes and sells everything and buys the land. The kingdom of God, the, the, the message of the gospel is like a, a farmer going out and planting seeds. Jesus does that over and over and over again. He pulls things from the world they live in and said, this is what this is like. This is what this is like. Yeah, Bob? Well, this, in this world, we have all kinds of physical morals. We see it every day, every day, about the same our food and our clothes. And God is trying to define all the food and all the, and all the trying to get properties. To sure, to sure. Yeah, we, we, we live in a world that's full of norms, and we think we know normal. And sometimes God will pull things that seem to be abnormal and say, no, this is, this is kind of what God's like. This is what dealing with God is like. And you say, well, but that's not normal. Ha, ha, bingo, right? You, you, you got it. It's not normal. It's not normal for God to seek after humans. It's more normal in the human event of history for humans to seek after God which is one of the roots of how religion in general is different from Christianity. In Christianity, it's God that seeks after lost humans. In the rest of the religions of the world, it's, it's lost humans trying to get God's attention and seeking after him. The flow is different, and it makes all the difference in the world. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't get God's attention and say, okay, I straightened up my life enough. Come help me now. God says, no, no. You're, you're mine. I bought you with a big price. And uh, so the same kind of thing is going on here. So I just want you to see these pictures. These pictures kind of do fit in with what he's, he's describing here. Um, let's read verse 10 again. Their faces looked like this. Each of the four had a face of a human being. On the right side, uh, each had the face of a lion. On the left, the face of an ox. Each also had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. They each had two wings spreading out upward, each wing touching that of the creature on either side. There's a picture in there of some, yeah, some, some beings doing that, holding up a table. <laughs> You'll see their wings are holding the, 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 the edges of the table. Yeah. Um. Yes. Two examples would be Joseph had the dream of the sheaves, his stood erect, his brothers bowed down. Yes. That was not a literal happening, it was a symbolic. Yes. In Daniel, when he's describing the Roman Empire, he says, and the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery. Yes. Again, symbolic language, not literal language. Right. So I think if you try to apply too much literal to this Ezekiel thing, you're just going to get confused. 
See, I think you're right. I think you've got to keep in mind what the author had in mind when he wrote it to the people that he wrote it to initially. The Bible was written for us, but it was not written to us. It was written to these ancient people, and we get benefit from it. But we weren't the we 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 weren't by the the we weren't by the river with, with Ezekiel when he got this vision. We can read about it. We know about it. We can learn from it. Where the beneficiaries of that teaching and further teaching that came afterwards. But that's an important thing to remember. These things were written for us, but not to us. And so, if you try to read all these ancient things through the lenses of 21st century glasses, it's not going to look right. And the problem is not the Bible, and the problem is not the way the Bible was written, and the problem is not the authorship of the Bible. The problem is we're trying to force the Bible to do something that it was never intended to do. I don't believe the Bible was ever intended to support the ancient alien astronaut theory. But you put those glasses on and start looking page after page after page, and I, it would be surprising if you didn't find places of all this symbolic language that God likes to use. Ooh, that sounds like an ancient alien to me. I bet it didn't sound like an ancient alien to the people that first read it. <laughs> yeah, see, that's the point. So, so to me, I, 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 don't, I don't really care. Somebody says, well, somebody says, why is it a big deal whether there's aliens or not? Well, there's some people who believe that if there were aliens that God would have to have a salvation plan for them too. And they start thinking, well, does that mean Jesus lived on multiple planets and was crucified multiple times? Who knows? And, 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 and does it really matter to you and me? Does it, if, if, if they could prove to me tomorrow that there were aliens out there somewhere, it wouldn't shake my faith in God. Somebody said, oh, would it would mine? Well, you need to think it through then. Maybe your faith's not as strong or as solid as you think it is. Maybe the, the thing you're putting your faith in is the wrong thing, right? Um, it's, re, it's, it's why you've got to be a student. It's why you've got to be in prayer. It's why you've got to be in community of other believers. It's because we can kind of get off track, and sometimes we get off track, and our faith is not what it's supposed to be in any way. Um, it says in verse... Uh, 12, as they moved, they could go in any one of the four directions the creatures faced. Somewhere in there, there's a, a long skinny leg table with straight legs that have wheels on the bottom of it. It would have been a table that was used by the pagan priests in their worship rites. You know, kind of like, I use this. If we, had the, if we had wheels on this, you know, or wheels on this. Um, I think that's what he's describing. Oh, no, no, no. He's describing an ancient spaceship. I'll put it on the cover of my book. Okay. All right. All right. Um, anyway, it says, when the creatures moved, they, that is the wheels, also moved. When the creatures stood still, they also stood still. When the creature rose from the ground, the wheels rose along with them because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. What do you mean living wheels? It's a vision. It's, 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 it's. It's not literal language, but it's using literal images to, to get a point across, I think. Maybe you don't, won't agree with me by the time we're done with this. Verse 22, spread out among the heads of the living creatures was what so looked something like a vault, sparkling like crystal and awesome. Under the vault, their wings were stretched out one to another, and they each had two wings covering his body, its body. When the creatures moved, I heard the sound of their wings like the roar of rushing waters, like the voice of the Almighty, like the tumult of an army. When they stood still, they lowered their wings. Then there came a voice from above the vault over their heads as they stood with lowered wings. Above the vault over their heads was what looked like a throne of lapis lazuli. And high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal, as if he was full of fire, and that from there down, he looked like fire, and a brilliant light surrounded him. Ooh, that must be an ancient astronaut using a belt pack of some kind. If you're gonna, if, if, if you're gonna go with that line of thought, that's as good as any, I guess, but I don't personally buy it. 
Uh, like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down, and I heard the voice of one speaking. Now let me ask you a question. Have you seen the word angel yet in this chapter? He's obviously, he's obviously, he's obviously des describing something that's not fully human, that's not fully of this world. Why is the word angel not used? See, who remembers the first class we had? All right, all right. The book of Revelation reads an awful lot like this. A lot of the same details are found there, too. What were you going to say, Roy? There you go. Angel is a title or a job description. What is, an, what is an angel? An angel is a messenger from God. Are any of these, is there any place in this chapter yet where an angel is giving a message from God? No. No. See, these are not... These spiritual beings, these heavenly beings, we call them in English angels, but the word angel means a messenger. A messenger is only a messenger if they have a message and they're giving it. These beings aren't giving a message, they're just being. They're just existing in this vision, this, this, uh, this maybe dream, this trance, whatever it was that Ezekiel found himself in. He sees these kind of strange things. Uh, look at the next ver chapter, verse 1. He ends that chapter by saying there was a voice that spoke to him. Here's an interesting phrase. He said to me, son of man... Do all your translations have that in verse 1 of chapter 2? Son of man. Who in the New Testament was called the son of man? Jesus Christ said he was the son of man. What did that mean? Yeah. He was a human being. He was a human being. The son of man is... Is a human being. That's what the Hebrew phrase means. A human being. I don't think it's any. I don't think it's any uh, coincidence that this image of the throne room of God has an authoritative voice that's connected to the Son of Man who is going to come to Earth and be an authoritative voice. <laughs> you can disagree with me, but I think that's what's going on here. And you see this phrase, the Son of Man, all through the rest of the book. And many, most, most Bible translations will, will take that phrase, uh, Ben Adam. Ben means son, Adam means man, male. So he's a son of males, he's a son of humans. He's a son of Adam, if you put a capital A on the Adam. Um, most scholars think there's a connection between the Son of Man in this vision and the Son of Man that walked the earth was crucified for our sins. Um, but you'll have to think about that. He said to me, Son of Man. Ooh. Who is the Son of Man? Yeah, there's this loud voice talking to Ezekiel. <laughs> now think about that for just a minute. Son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak to you. As he spoke, the spirit came into me and raised me to my feet and I heard him speaking to me. Is there a sense in which you and I are sons of men? Daughters of men? Offspring of humans. Yeah. Yeah. So what did it mean when Jesus claimed that title in capital letters as the Son of Man? And what's different here about this voice from heaven, an authoritative voice calling Ezekiel, you, 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 you Son of Man, you human you. I'm talking to you. 
You humans, stand on your feet. I'm going to talk to you. What's the difference between the Son of Man here and the Son of Man in the New Testament? Are there any differences? Or are there more similarities? Well, the Son of Man, if you're referring to the Messiah, was God. Yes, the Messiah was God in the flesh. Exactly, exactly. Ezekiel wasn't God. Ezekiel wasn't God. Was there a lot of difference between what the two of them did from this point forward? Weren't both of them going to become messengers of the Most High? Jesus was obviously a messenger. Here's Ezekiel being called to be a messenger. When Ezekiel spoke the word of God, <laughs> whose words were they? Were they God's or were they Ezekiel's? See, it's the same kind of question, right? Exactly. You quote Abraham Lincoln, whose words are they? Yeah. Even among, uh, even among the unchristian type schools, the uh, Why? Well, because what plagiarism is, is taking someone else's words or ideas, not giving them credit and saying that they're yours. What did Jesus do when he came? Whose words did he speak? His own? Kind of. But talking to humans, he used this illustration where he says, I don't speak of my own. I speak whatever the Father tells me is what I speak. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You didn't see me as a great human. You saw God living through me, Jesus said. And this is, the, this is Jesus, <laughs> the guy who got it right. Not like me, not like you. The guy that got it right, he says... I don't speak of my own authority. I speak the words of the ones who sent me. What was Ezekiel being asked to do here? As a human being, speak the words of the one who sent him. Um, he said, Son of man, I'm sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been in revolt to me against this very day. The people whom I'm sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Sounds like some of the churches I've preached for. <laughs> Sounds like the guy in the mirror in the morning sometimes. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. And yeah, God goes on and tells them, do not be afraid. Speak my words. Do what I tell you to do. Be a good representative for me. Um. Don't rebel like rebellious people. Open your mouth. Eat what I give you. Kind of interesting, strange wording. Then I looked and saw a hand stretched out to me, and on it was a scroll, on which he, which he unrolled before me. On both sides of it were written words of lament, warning, and woe. Uh, there's so many of these little details that are repeated again in John's book of Revelation. And I think that they're probably describing the same place in the spirit world inhabited by some of the same beings in the spirit world, doing some of the same things in the spirit world. But you've got two people that were chosen by God to be representatives of that spirit thing to human beings who've never been there and who've never seen it. And what's another word for that kind of a messenger? Okay, there's a prophet, but prophets generally were, were uh, uh, more, more specific kind of a messenger. <laughs> An angel. So when somebody looks at you and pinches you on the cheek and says, you're just a little angel, aren't you? Well, it's kind of up to you whether you are or not. If they mean a little, little cute cherub playing a harp floating on a cloud someplace, no, you're not that. But if you're a son of man representing the God most high with your life and with your words and the way you treat people. There are some people that your life is the only Bible they'll ever read, which is a scary thought. An interaction with you is the closest some people have ever came to having an encounter with the God most high. Why? Because we're his representatives. We're representatives. We do the same kind of thing these angels do. 
And so one of the things I think that you see here in this, this passage of Ezekiel is that you see Ezekiel seeing this great and grand throne room with these great and grand powerful beings and images. And it just kind of overwhelms him. And I think what God is calling him to do is to come and participate in this with me. I want to give you messages, Ezekiel, and I want to give you a forehead like flint. I'm going to send you to a stubborn and rebellious people, and I want you to be brave. I want you to stand strong, and I want you to not care what people think. I want you to say what I tell you to say and be a man. Go to war. Be my representative and be a good one. And this is what you're representing to people who have never had any contact with it. We're doing the same thing. We've not been brought up into the third heaven where God resides like Paul had. We've not had the kind of a, 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 a night dream like Ezekiel or Daniel or John did. And yet, we know more about God. We know more about his ways. We know more about his, his government than most other people on the planet. And that's why Paul told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians, we're ambassadors for Christ. The United States has ambassadors that work through embassies and state departments on foreign soil, right? And so they build embassies, and by law, the embassy and the embassy grounds, even though they're in that country, that's considered American soil. And an ambassador will go and interface with that American soil in a foreign country, and he becomes the spokesman for our nation and our people. He's the face for thousands and thousands of people that the people in that country will never see. What if he does a bad job? What if he's a jerk? What if he's lazy? What if he sees the messages that the president sends him and he crumples up and says, I'll tell them what I want to tell them. Or I'm not going to tell them that. I've got to sleep in tomorrow. See, that's, it's, it's, it's an important thing for us to be a messenger or a representative for God. And the imagery here is you're being invited into a very, very exclusive group of representatives for the God of the universe. Yeah, I just want to make a point about this in verse 5. It says, whether they listen or not, they'll know a prophet has been among them. <laughs> Yes. Yep. Exactly. It's our job to warn. It's our job to instruct. It's our job to correct. And people say, well, I don't want you telling me what to do. Who are you to tell me what to do? Well, you don't want to be pompous and you don't want to be rude, but in the back of your head, you ought to be saying to yourself, I've been called and I've been delegated by the king of the universe to tell you what to do because it's not my words, it's not my decision, it's not my fault. I'm just the mouthpiece. I'm just the secretary. I'm just the spokesperson. You got an argument with what I'm saying. It's not an argument with me. It's an argument with the person that I'm representing. This is, and that's the point. Once you, once you give the message that God wants them to have, if they refuse, God tells the, the prophets in a couple of places. He tells uh, uh, Samuel, before they made Saul a king, God says, don't worry, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. Right? It's kind of like in my family when I was growing up, I was the oldest of four kids, and many times my mom would say, go tell the other kids to come wash up for dinner. Go tell all the other kids to turn off the lights in their bedrooms and get their homework done. Go tell all the kids we're doing laundry, they can get their dirty clothes out of their bedroom. And there were times that I would go and tell them. And of course, as the perfectly... Uh, calm and benign older brother. I would never try to scrub, uh, stir them up. I would never say anything that would make them angry, right? And I'd tell them what mom said to do, and I might kind of scrub their head while I was telling them, or I might mess with something in their room while I was in there, and they'd start screaming and hollering, saying, you're not my boss. You can't tell me what to do. Talk to mom. I can't tell you the number of times I went back in and she said, okay, where's all the stuff? Well, I told them, mom. <laughs> they, said, they said I wasn't their boss. Did you tell them I sent you? Oh yeah, mom, I told them. 
Well, I tell you what, I'll fix that. And she'd mutter as she went down the hall and she'd roust them out and they'd get in trouble and I'd go, shh, shh. And then I'd wonder the next day or two why my different siblings would find ways to get back at me. They'd mess up my stuff. They'd tie the sleeves of my shirt together in the back of the closet. They, they did all kinds of... Where'd they learn to do that? I don't know. I don't know. See, we do, that's the way we live. That's the way, that's, the way, that's the way we run the things that we do. We shouldn't be surprised that God does things that way. But this is a whole lot bigger deal than getting up dirty socks to go in the washing machine or to get our homework done so we can stack our school books and get ready to go to school tomorrow. This is, this is, a, this is really a big deal. Um, anyway, I'm convinced this is a passage talking about angelic beings, what in English we call angelic beings. You need to know that the text does not say these are angels. It just says they're beings that Ezekiel saw. It could be that, that they would be angels in English, but not in Hebrew. What I mean by that is, it, it could have been that they are uh, angelic beings that do jobs other than being a messenger. You know? Wow, I hadn't ever thought about it. Yeah, I know. And they said, Where do you get that? I don't know. I could be wrong. I could have it completely different way, the way it's not. That's just kind of the way that, that, that it starts kind of making sense to me as I think through these things. Um, Anyway, so the next time you get a chance, make my wife proud and watch one of those ancient alien shows on one of the cable channels. If you have it, you're in for a treat. Some of those guys have got crazy hairdos, they've got crazy ideas, they've got crazy eyes. And if you think from the standpoint of logic and reason, you'll sit there and you'll shake your head and say, these people are insane. And it's not because you disagree with them, it's because there's no chain of logic, there's no chain of reason. They start from things that you can't know and say, well, I think this is true, and if that's true, then this is true. And if that's true, then this is true. Whoa, 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 the first step back here <laughs> hadn't been proven. Well, you know, we're just talking. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Anyway, uh, next week we'll talk about uh, some of the beings that Zechariah saw. Zechariah saw um, four horsemen. I wonder where John got the idea of four horsemen. Uh, there's a phrase in our language, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And horses of different colors had different vision, meanings in John's vision. Uh, there's a very similar vision in the book of Zechariah. We'll talk about them. Next week, it's, uh, he sees these horses running in a, a forest of, um, I think it's acacia wood. And it was the kind of wood that they made the Ark of the Covenant out of. And they made other special, you know. And at one time, these trees were all over the land of Palestine before they were overforested. Anyway, that's the, that's the plan for next time. Let's, uh, let's end with a prayer. Father, we thank you for the, uh, the depth and the riches that come through your word. Thank you that uh, you've given us so much that we can study and learn and never exhaust what there is to know and learn about you and your people and your word. We pray, God, that you would help us to be uh, not just uh, hearers of the word, but doers. May we, uh, may we be eager to put into practice the things that we learn May we not be like those in the day of Jesus who were always learning but never learned, always hearing but couldn't hear. We don't want to be those kind of people, God, and we ask your blessing and your leadership to help us not fall into those traps. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's see, where did the paper go? You guys still got the papers? I was going to show that on the screen before I turned this off. Yeah. Turn this off. Here's some of these pictures that come from ancient Assyrian, Babylonian things of worship. There's one. See the, the, the four winged beings? Uh, see these beings that their wings are holding up the table? Yeah. And uh, here's a different way that these beings held up things. You can see them in the sides of the throne of the Assyrian and Babylonian king. Uh, 
here's some other beings that were used in their iconographic to icon, 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 I can't even say the word now. Anyway, the images they used in their religion. Uh, oh, here's one of those tables with the wheels. Yeah, see the wheels at the bottom? They have those straight legs. There's no knees. And the wheels turn when you move the table. Um, here's some images from a very small cylinder steel. It's about the size of a ring for a finger that would have made an impression in wax. And uh, here's a being that's got the wings and it's got eyes over its whole body. In fact, it's anatomically correct at its groin. Uh, it doesn't have to be sensors on a spaceship. This was what they incorporated in their worship. And it's my belief, the point is, God is saying, uh, God is greater than all these, these, these different kinds of gods. Anyway, thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll see you again soon.